Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks for being here. For uh, kind of kicking off kind of a new series, you know, typical for my channel, but uh, new as far as content and the course that I plan on going with this information. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining me tonight. Let's just uh, run through. Uh, make sure everything's working. I've changed a bunch of stuff as I've already talked about. Okay. Looks like we're going. How's my audio? I've got all new microphone settings. So let me know if I'm too loud or too quiet. I'm going to run through chat to say hi to everybody. <clears throat> all right. Where are we at here? Robert, hopefully you're still here. Thanks for joining me. Zellarum, I'm going to mess that name up. Welcome. Brian, thanks for being here. Lone Star, good to see you again. Brett, always good to see you, Brett. Cheers. Sassy Nix, hey, welcome. I haven't seen you in a little bit. Juju, socks on. Welcome. Tribe of Nan, cheers from the north shores of the Great Lake of Ontario. Welcome. Thank you. Risen. Old World Micmac, perfect. Just the guy I want to have in here because uh, we're going to get into some Micmac lore. We're going to get into uh, Algonquin, Iroquois, Ancient America. Um, I'm going to start bridging the gaps between Ancient America, India Superior, um, Ari, Ari Land, Ireland. India, the Brahmins, Buddha, Vishnu. Um, what, what, how Christianity, Christianity changed its actual roots, not only, you know, quote, Abyssinian or Ethiopian, but also, uh, quote, Irish or Ari. Um, and how this kind of, this will be like, a turning of the page or turning of the chapters between my Etruscan series. Um, although this is called Buried Empires of Ancient America, you know, the kind of the theme of the channel is Buried Empires. And um, you'll see the first article I'm going to get into is kind of what kick-started the, the thumbnail, so to say. But this will be... Uh, a bit of a bridge into, quote, Irish history, ancient Irish history, connecting it again with Mesoamerica, um, the Fertile Crescent, um, tracing languages, the Phoenicians, the Finns, the Irish, you know, again, Atlantis, Lemuria. Um, but yeah, so this will be fun. I don't have a, a definite layout as far as um, plan here. Um, we're going to talk about Norum Vega, this mystical city. Um, Ireland the Great, which was, you know, again, Vinland, this area that was supposed to encompass um, Virginia, the Carolinas. Um, but yeah, we're going to kind of close the gap between Nestorianism, um, Manchus, the Chinese, Babylonians, get deeper into the languages, um, hop, find a bridge between runic, ogham, and into phonetics. So yeah, that was a mouthful there, but, um, yeah, so part two of this series will be a little bit deeper into the idea of Ireland the Great, um, what that means or what that meant, 1800s, early 1900s, even earlier than that, you know, maybe open the eyes of people a little bit more into the idea of the Norsemen. And yeah, so appreciate all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to do a little quick, get my tabs organized here real quick. 
let a few more people hop in. But yeah, we're going to kick off with Barry and Empires. We're going to probably hop back and forth between a few of my Anomalous America episodes. Um, showing again kind of more co corroboration. We'll talk about the seven cities of gold, the seven cities of Cibola, um, New Granada, um, the diffusions of races, Arizona, exactly. I talked about that in my Arizona episode. And that Arizona and New Mexico were an ancient seat of the Druids. Um, how that wraps up into the whole picture. Um, but yeah, we're going to kind of tear the veil off the, the past as far as the kind of the pre babble so to say, the one world religion. Um, Christianity, as we know today, is, a, is an offshoot of a much older... Um, I wouldn't even call it a religion. I would call it kind of more of an understanding, an understanding of oneself and purpose. And the internal became external. This kind of, uh, as God ventured away from being an internal thing in an inward journey and became an external source and um, idol worship and all these things kind of stemming from this. We're also going to talk a little bit about uh, Julian James, we're going to try to bridge the gaps between the bicameral mind. Well, we got some CMA. Thank you so much for the donation. Hope everyone is doing well. Peace. Thank you for being here. And Michael Brown, I appreciate you guys very much. It means a lot. As I've said many times, your donations mean the world to me and they keep me doing this. Uh, just getting time away from the family was a very large struggle over the last few days. I had planned on doing this for a few days. And um, so it justifies a lot. And I appreciate it very much. Um, kind of some coming um, information for you guys as well. Um, I did a Decoding the Super Bowl series um, with my friend uh, Cyclops. Um, he's got some, uh, personal life, uh, feats he's on a new journey and I'm hoping that we can get together again soon. We're planning on doing a comet, uh, eclipse breakdown video. So much to do there. So I've been holding on to tons of material, hoping that, uh, me and him can get the stars to align, no pun intended, and do another episode together. Um, I'm doing it. I have an Easter episode coming out. Um, so, yeah, that's going to kind of correlate a little bit here with this Irish mythology, you know, Ostara, Ishtar, uh, bridging the gaps between these different religions and showing, again, the similarities that are endless between them all. Uh, the beginning of the year, fertility, you know, as a man myself that lived on land and raised a bunch of animals. This is a very important time of year, and you could see it coming without ever like having a calendar or someone telling you this because the animals clearly tell you. If it's the frogs, um, the nights come alive, the crickets start chirping, the frogs start chirping, the animals start looking to, <laughs> uh, you know, make 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 babies, and yeah, it's a great time of year and. So we'll talk about Easter. I'm hoping to do a live stream on Sunday, but the reality of that is probably few and far between. So we're going to shoot for maybe Monday, but we'll see. So stay in, stay tuned for an Easter video. Um, again, I'll run through chat real quick. Again, I appreciate Michael Brown and CMA. Your donations are treasured. They mean a lot. Thank you so much. Um, again, Brett, um, Twilight Mist. I just listened to a video earlier done by Kabbalist who pointed out how the word commanded is idolatry because if you take orders of command the commander is the idol yes um we're gonna also loop this series back in with the lodestone material that i've talked about since i started the channel and long before that actually uh, we're going to talk about the coronation stones and how they have very powerful roots going back to atlantis the scots the irish 
um, India, the Lingdom Stone, on and on. So we're going to talk about idolatry, quote unquote, commander, magnetic, uh, conscious stones, um, and how this relates again to a post cataclysmic world, huge migrations of people, um, and possibly the creation of the quote by Campbell mind period being related again to this idolatry, the idea that the inner monologue um, was null and void and that mankind as we know it was more of a um, automatic kind of hypnotic state and how this relates again to idolatry and people trying to find the voice of God and the creation of the priest class and so on and so forth. <sighs> but yeah, great comment. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So I was doing something. I already spaced it. We're going to apologies. Just getting my Okay. Lost Empires. Let's get some share screen going here. Mm -hmm. um, this will lead to a sub-series where I do more on the antiquities of America. I've already done one video on that. I've talked about several other correlations. Um, Norm Bega info is hard to come across. Yes, old world Micmac it is. And I think I have some of the best Norm Bega information there is. And like so many other things we've found and come across over the years and that I've dedicated my channel towards, these old articles in the 1800s are going to really help us kind of break down the idea of Norm Bega. Um, yeah, we're going to make some interesting correlations between Disney and this American empire that through cataclysm and so on and many, many things, you know, we've talked about many successions of races and cataclysms and so on. And yeah, so the transitory period, we'll be talking about mound builders, the relation between, again, the Etruscan mound builders, the Irish so many things, right? These mounds are found all over the globe. But again, bridging the gap as I was doing, ending, kind of ending, but it's never over my Mesoamerican series, my Mexico series, jumping into the Etruscan work. So, you know, eventually we'll probably do a whole series wrapping it all together. Um, Scythians, the first Scythians, quote Scythian, what's a Scythian? Saka, the Saka people. Right, because the Scythian was a name applied to them by Rome, just like a Tartar, and so many others. We're going to find that the, that these classifications and this this kind of whirling, spinning identification problem that we have is obviously connected to the fall of the Aturian Empire. Which, again, who were the Aturians? The Etruscans were they Irish? The Iri, the Aria, yes, absolutely they were. And the Council of Nicaea plainly shows this, that their rebranding of Christianity was based on this old world religion that existed everywhere. And Nestorianism, we're going to show the idea of not only Prester John, but Genghis Khan, these um, the Buddhist religions, how they all have roots of this same culture, right? We talk about Tartaria, blah, blah, blah. Um, one of the major concepts I threw around years ago when I was doing the Radio Tartary show with Victor was we talked about how many of these star forts had, you know, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, all just next door to each other and how that came to pass and what that represented and that really it was just different brandings by different cultures of the same inner inner religion so to say again i hate using the word religion but um, the inter the inner 
understanding of oneself and how those things got rebranded and and that all of these religions have been adjusted and changed especially since the 1800s but even before 1700s 1600s and that their roots come from the same source but yeah so again this is uh, an article called our buried empires a remarkable article on ancient america it's from a Nevada newspaper, 1875. And then from here, we're going to jump into a burial story, which is kind of a weird transition, I know. Um, but that will lead us deeper into the Ireland, the great saga, the idea of Vinland, and so on and so forth. So let's jump right into it. And again, appreciate all of you for being here. Uh, yeah, uh, Joe just posted my Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx. We're going to talk about Le Pont Jean. He, he dies quite neatly into this. Um, um, I'm hoping that, you know, again, time permitting, I'm always uh, 50 steps ahead, but time never allows me to get too far into here. Um, I'm hoping to get into some Ignatius Donnelly and his writings. Um, um I got another author. I got two other books that I'm trying to incorporate here, but you know, you know how that is. Um, Akkadi and the Akkadians, where we're going to dive into the quote aboriginals, the links between the Algonquins and the Irish and Gaelic and Welsh and how these things tie in with so many other things. Um, and then we're going to get into um, a little bit of Barry Fell's work. I've talked about him quite a lot. Um, and then um, Irish Wisdom Preserved in Bible and Pyramids by Connor McDarry. Um, I've posted a lot over the 12, 13 years I've been on Twitter and that I've kind of been sharing my thoughts about this book. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to kind of dive into this book and have a series where I can share this material. If you aren't familiar with that book, for those of you out there, my fellow archivists, um, I can't say enough about it. It's one of my top 10 books when it comes to historical um, references and kind of connecting dots, so to say. Again, that's Irish Wisdom Preserved in Bible and Pyramids by Connor McDarty. Um, it's available for free all over, and you know archive.org is my favorite. So, But yeah, here we go. I'm going to stop rambling. Love you guys so much. Thanks for being here tonight. Let's jump in. The researches of Borberg, now I've mentioned him in previous articles when we talked about um, eight antiquities of the 1800s, right? Um, he's He's been quoted in several articles called The Antiquities, The Buried Past of America, where he talks a lot about uh, civilizations gone and lost and correlates them quite nicely with biblical references. And, but this one will be a little known void of biblical stuff, but you'll see the correlations if you've watched my previous videos. The researches of Borberg says is writer in the St. Louis Republican prove the existence of a great Mexo Mexo Central American empire in ancient times called Zabalba. The kings of the old American empire reigned in couples. Together, they constituted a grand council of the empire. They had a tradition of a flood, which they call the atlas, from alt, meaning water, the etymology of which word is found only in the Nuhatl tongue. Here we find the derivation of the various names. Nahuatlan, Mazatlan, and Atlan, which have been given to cities and towns of Mexico and Central American continent. There is scarcely ground for doubt that this continent had been visited by the Irish before the beginning of the 6th century of our era. Now, you know, again, following the term Irish, these people did not like being called Celtic. Celtic was a different branding, as we've said so much over the years, that these titles that we've carried with us into the 21st century are a creation of the, of the false Rome, so to say. Indeed, Virgil, a saint of that country, was accused by a bishop to Pope Zachary of teaching heresy respecting the existence of a continent on the western side of the Atlantic, 
and made a journey to Rome to defend himself. Now we're going to get into migrations again. How many cultures? Again, we've talked about the the Egyptians, um, the Greeks, um, even some older Moorish lore, the Irish, the Scottish. That they're wanderers from the West. That they came east from the West. And we covered this in my um, Mesoamerican series quite um, obviously when we talked about Queen Mu and, and the Egyptian cultures and the Redlands and the kind of, quote, Atlantean culture. He succeeded in convincing the pontiff that his countrymen had an intercourse with a country beyond the ocean. But the most remarkable part of these relations is the evidence that America was peopled by a great and prosperous race, that splendid cities existed and mighty, mighty monarchs reigned. It was doubtless the golden age of the ancient American civilization. When the stranger came to Carthage and when the Meropes visited the Hyperboreans, we're going to get into the Hyperboreans as well as we dive deeper into this <laughs> The venerable men who are told came to Chios before the time of Alexander from the great inland island beyond the Atlantic Ocean might have been a sage from Uxmal, Ometipak, Atlan, Palenque, or Cholula. We're going to show again many more correlations between the Mesoamerican culture, the Aztecs, the Etruscans, and these, uh, these early Ari. Aryan, Aryan uh, correlations, not only with language, but culture, religion, so many things. Or it may be possible that he went from he went from the still more ancient seat of civilization, the relics of which remain in the country of Chickasaw, Mississippi. And one can just go to my Mississippi episode uh, of Anomalous America and see all kinds of crazy shit in the um, what mean the pyramids of the Yazoo Valley? These huge piles of earth reared by human hands were the work of a race, every authentic trace of which has vanished. We talk a lot about Eastern cultures, German especially, um, ransacking the mound building culture in the early to mid 1800s. In the valley of the Tennessee, near the town of Florence in Alabama, there is a mound or a pyramid. Now we'll talk about Florence. We'll make correlations again between Florence, Florence of Italy, Florence of Alabama, Al Alabama, um, and the Florence of Arizona. We're going to talk about how Arizona, a seat of an Ari culture, um, was one of the most densely populated for flourishing metropolises of the ancient America, which again, one need only go back, look through my Arizona episode to see that every major city in Arizona today stands on the foundations of a buried civilization. The oldest representations of Masonic, quote, Masonic, again, we're going to show how this is all the same one world religion, that Masonry of today is kind of just like the falsities of Rome, a counter, a counterfeit of an ancient culture. Uh, yeah, we'll correlate more stuff again between Mesoamerica, the pyramids, mounds, Etruscan mounds, burial mounds, so on and so forth. Still about 70 feet high, the four sides of which face the cardinal points of the compass and are formed with geometrical precision. We're going to show that in these mounds they found Buddhist iconography, Hindu, Christian, on and on and on, Islamic, that all of these things were one and the same. And they go back to a central period where, again, the separations of religion and all and race, they didn't exist. We were one culture of people trying to make our best in a hellish world of cataclysm and monsters. And yeah, the base of this grand work covers a little more than an acre of ground. In the immediate vicinity of this large pyramid, there are four smaller ones, which occupy the position of corners. Now, again, um, I did an interview with Topher from BioCharisma recently, where we dive deeper into my Missouri, Anomalous America, Missouri episode, where I show that when they were building the bridge between St. Louis and, and uh, East St. Louis across the river, they uncovered a subterranean tunnel 
that connected the mounds of St. Louis with Cahokia Monk's Mound. Again, these tunnels went on forever. And they found that under all of these mounds, which were actually giant pyramids that extended far below the earth, were huge subterranean highways. And they found Egyptian uh, iconography, Babylonian, on and on and on, right? And that these cultures were all, I don't want to say originating, perhaps flourishing at the same time um, as the cultures that we're thought to say would be the originators or the only place where they're found. Um, but yeah, back to where I was. Uh, this great pyramid was doubtless at some time in the forgotten past surrounded by a temple in which the ancient American sun worshipers performed their devotions. Now, sun, sun worship. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the sun worship roots that exist with all of these religions that we'll be talking about and showing the correlation between that and how sun worship, the fall of the vapor canopy, the bicameral mind, the externalizing of, of God, instead of God being this internal voice, it became an external source and the people were looking everywhere they could to find this voice that they had lost. Again, the kind of idea that trauma segments the brain and that these segmentations of the brain created the inner dialogue and how language goes along with this. The idea of the Tower of Babel perhaps not only being a literal representation or a historical event, but also a figurative one, a mythological one, a representation of the, of the inner self, the mind, uh, the fracturing of the mind, the losing of that inner God, and that... Um, idol worship comes from people trying to find that voice and that the burying of the dead and these mounds, many of these cultures, and the, the quote Native American Aboriginal cultures of America were the closest representation that we had to this, um, described that these burials, the voices could be heard, that the dead could be heard still, and that the idea of these burials and the kind of acoustic properties that go into these mounds and that the voice of the of their ancestors would never be lost and that we can kind of trace these funeral burial ceremonies and and ideas back to this uh unicameral bicameral transition period <sighs> perhaps at the very time when the subjects of Serostris, Serostris were building the walls and the gates of Thebes. A great city covered the plain through whose streets busy thousands rushed, but the city has crumbled away and the people have passed to oblivion's shoreless gulf. Now, I think one of the biggest things we can take away from anomalous America is that America was covered in cities, covered from California to Florida the tips of Canada, Alaska, obviously. Remember, Alaska was quite clearly a tropical climate and quite recently, not 100,000 years ago, a few hundred years ago is what I'm postulating. And that Alaska was covered in, quote, Grecian cities, Scythian burial mounds. Actually, what they called them were Etruscan. And we'll show again the correlations between Scythians and Etruscans, the Saka people. Scythian is a new name. They were branded as Scythians and bar barbarians and Tartars and many things. But yeah, so this whole realm was completely covered, densely populated, millions if not billions of people, very advanced. In the region from Fort Pillow to Vicksburg and from the Mississippi to the Tennessee and the Tobigby, there are remains of ancient civilization found in many localities. At Fort Pickering below Memphis and at Florence, Alabama, and between Hernando and Commerce and in Chickasaw County and along the Yazoo River and near the town of Porterville, Tennessee, there are collections of burial mounds and pyramidal temple sites covering large areas which show that in these localities, the predecessors of the, quote, wild Indians had stately cities, but those who reared them and dwelt in them lie entombed in their ruins. We can almost trace the course of civilization of the American continent by the monuments which have been left. The mound builders of the northern parts of America gave place to savage tribes from the region still further north. 
These were doubtless hordes of Scythians forced out of Asia by some earlier Zangus, Khans, and Tamerlanes, who precipitated themselves on the more civilized and Pacific dwellers in American cities as their kindred barbarians poured down upon luxury enervated Romans and came near extinguishing the torch of civilizations for which centuries had illuminated the shores of the Mediterranean. Now, again, the idea that huge amounts of land have come and gone um, is something I talk quite clearly about as well when we think about the vapor canopy and the rise and fall of whole lands and the idea that, you know, the, the, the Bering Sea was quite a different place than it is now. And obviously, Alaska was a tropical paradise, but a few hundred years ago. So it's not a stretch to think that these huge calamities and rising and falling of huge landmass and the idea of land bridges, which I've talked about um, a lot I've, in my posts on Easter Island, and some of my um, Pacific Island videos, I talk about these land bridges and how they're quite, it's quite easy to see when you look at what lies just, you know, a mile off the coastline of every continent on earth, there are remains of ancient civilizations. And so when we think about people leaving Asia, what if Asia as we know it, Cafe, as I like to call it, was one large area. Again, we're going to correlate the Brahmins and the Druids, the Ari, the Aryan, India, the ancient name of India, definitely not India, and how North America, as we know it, Cafe, um, Abyssia, Ethiopia, uh, Ireland, the Great, all of these things were were one cultural representation of a huge empire that was destroyed by i wouldn't say just one event but several and you could tie this in with the, the giant megafauna giant trees um this avatar type of period and how we've gone through i would say you know as the aztecs say four periods three transitional events that had led us to where we are today And again, those of you new to my channel, I have quite a lot of videos on all these things I'm mentioning. So if something sticks out to you, check my archive. And I'm sure I have something that uh, will strike your fancy when it comes to showing evidences of these things I'm mentioning. Forced from their ancient seats by the fresh eruption of savage Mongolians, who were the progenitors of most of the North American Indians, the mound builders, who had received their civilization from the early Phoenician adventurers. Again, so the, 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 this is something that can't, that is very important to remember in the 1800s that these articles are openly discussing the relation between the Phoenicians and their cultures in India, their cultures in, in Mongolia, in China, in Peru, in Mesoamerica, in North America, in Ireland, in the Mediterranean, in Africa. Um, and it's time now to share one of my favorite Phoenician articles from a it's the only one of its kind. It's probably the best article I've ever found when it comes to kind of hidden information about the Phoenicians. This was a talk given at an Odd Fellows um, gathering. And we're really going to break into who the Phoenicians really were. The Finns, the, again, this is not a skin color cultural thing. This is a secret society. The Phoenicians were a secret group like the Druids but they were captains. Their secrets involved the keys to magnetism and much, much more, navigating the oceans and why that was so important in this time period. The migrate and migrated southward through Texas and Mexico, and finally into central and southern parts of Mexico. Uh, 
there the built other cities and founded empires. May not the ch- the Kalhuas, again, I apologize, who were the builders of Palenque, Uxmal, Cholula, Tijuan, Subtiaba, before the area of the Toltecan civilization. And, you know, Aztecs, that's a, that's a Roman application. You know, the Mayan is a false identification. Toltecan is as well. Um, I did a video on a part of my, my Etruscan series showing that Uxmal is an Eturian word uh, that you can find the correlations and foundations in with the Irish as well, and that their burial mounds are identical to the mounds found in Italy, Ireland, Alaska, on and on and on and on. And that we're not dealing with dozens of different cultures and, and religions that we're looking at, um, just a few. And, uh, and when it comes to religion, that our idea of religion today is not what it was just a few hundred years ago. Uh, before the era of the Toltecan civilization have been the expirated mound builders who once inhabited the Mississippi Valley. The Toltecs succeeded them, and the two people were so intermingled that the very legends of the Kahuas were forgotten. Doubtless, the civilization of both the Kalhuas and their immediate successors, the Toltecs, was in time promoted by the advent among them of a causeway cruise of maritime people on the orders of the Mediterranean. Yes, these, again, maritime people, very important. This is going to connect with uh, my work with Old World Florida. When we talk about Altland East, right, uh, Atlantis, the land of, of ice, um, the time of the Ice Age, quote, Ice Age, um, the Kalevala, um, these old myths. Um, we're going to get into Gotland, uh, Scotland, Gotland, Skota, Queen Skota, New Scotland. Um, yeah, man, there's just so much to, so many correlations with this material and the the buried past, so to say. Uh, uh, the Toltecs was in time promoted by the advent among the... Okay, yeah, these navigators sailing along the coast of Africa without compass or reckoning were frequently caught in storms and driven far out to sea. When reaching the westward flowing currents, they were wasted to the American shores. Now, this is kind of this fancy idea that, that the only way people made their way to the Americas was from the east, which is completely against all of their explanations and historical narratives they say quite clearly they came east from the west and one need only look at the ocean currents which i i think definitely could have changed especially considering some of these things we're talking about these rising and fallings of lands um but yeah the idea that it was by happenstance is a joke um what set the phoenicians apart from other maritime cultures was their ability to cross to sail at night, one, to sail without dead reckoning, without any idea of their location, cloud cover, without seeing land. Many maritime peoples were stuck to the shores. They had to keep uh, a visual representation of land, and they followed that course. Um, and again, this idea of who the Phoenicians were, we're going to get, get more into that. Um, I think maybe part two or part three, we'll dive into the, quote, secret society that is that is the Phoenician culture. Um, the return was impossible, and as much as they knew not of a certainty the direction whence they came, thus making a grace of necessity, they became teachers of the people, among whom they were cast. Montezuma told Cortez that he was sprung from the bearded white man who, ages before, had come across the Atlantic in ships and taught the people the art of civilized life. Now, uh, um, this kind of we'll get into this when we talk about uh, old representations of of uh, Quetzalcoatl, um, Kukulkan, you know the the toga, the sandal, the sage, you know these kind of priest kings and how they're found on every continent just under a different title, but the titles are very similar once you start to do the etymology and break down the languages. Will, Will Bickle 
Thank you for your donation. I appreciate it very much. Hebrew was Druid priest language, right? And who are the Hebrews? What's a Jew? I mean, our cultural ideas of of not only skin color, but cultural identity, religious identity, Jew, Hebrew. There were no Hebrews, so to say. Hebrew was more of a of a spiritual um application kind of uh not necessarily cultural identity or a sect of people and these things have all been uh kind of muddied the water has been muddied severely all of these cultures have been um destroyed and their histories rewritten um the irish obviously being one of these people um Montezuma, right? The libraries, the the quote Mayans. Remember, the Mayans didn't go by Mayan; they were known as the Z, which you can trace the the origins of the first uh, um, societies of China to these Z people. We're going to bridge the gap in language between the Chinese and the Babylonians and the 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 Irish. And yeah, so sage, captain, or chief. Yeah, yeah. Yep, we're going to get into all that stuff for sure. And I know Mick Mac, he knows his etymology well. The Aztec were really interested in helmets of the Spaniards, and at that time, they kind of looked like the Etruscan ones. Absolutely. When you think of the Etruscan attire, which some people would say is Greek, or even Trojan, right? Spartan. Uh, the oldest representations of those frayed helms and metalworking exist in the Americas. So, and again, they themselves say they came from the West. And after a cataclysm, they migrated south and then went east. So, again, many cultures, not just, not just the Mesoamerican culture. The Etruscans say themselves that they came from the lands of the West, the Egyptians. You know, what's a pharaoh? We're going to talk about titles and pharaohs and you know, Queen Skoda, Skota, Saka, on and on and on and on and on. I want to try to go through a few of your comments here before I get too much further into this article. And then we're going to finish again with this burial. Um, the remains of an Icelandic woman found in 1051 are found in America dating to 1051. That's where we're going to finish up with. Middle Tennessee here would love to show you some strange stuff. Short Mountain in Canyon County has some carvings of aliens 100 yards from Mason stone wall carvings. Yeah, George, great comment. Thank you. Uh, Tennessee is one of my favorite places in the world. I've had family that lived in Memphis. My, my mother was raised in um, Memphis. Um Check out my Anomalous America, Tennessee episode. It's an incredible place, full of a lot of clues to our ancient past. All right, and why they tried to kill off the Irish. I think that's maybe a relation to your Hebrew statement earlier. Hebrew was a Drew. Yeah, the Drew, the Druids, the Druidic language. They are. The, the Romans, we're going to connect this with the Finns and, and that the Romans were, quote, Romans, who replaced the Etruscans. We're going to get into identifying these people. They, they still hold the, the, the helm, so to say, today. <clears throat> uh, the Khazars, uh, e, e, there, there's some relation there, sure, but it's, that's, a, yeah, that's painting with a broad brush. So we're going to try to get a little more specific. Christ counsels people to wear white robes. Uh, okay. Are you, I'm not sure what the quotations are on that one, Sean, if you could be a little more specific, what you, why you're quoting Christ wear white robes. Yeah. So the secret of linen, I don't know if I'm, this is kind of actually, it's amazing how this stuff's kind of coming to the forefront, you know, Mormons, um, you know, they wear their, 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 their white garments that are undergarments, linen, the, the secret of linen, how the healing, um, transmutive properties of linen, um, the, how it's conducive to electrical charge. Um, yeah, there's a lot to the white robes, the linen robes. Hebrew is not a race or religion it is a language derived from Aramaic Latin. Did you mean Aramaic archaic Latin? Yeah. But then where's Latin come from Lisa? Cause I've done a video on Latin and Latin traces its roots from many other older versions as well. So that's kind of what we're trying to break open. Most names are titles, Henry, John, Charles. Abs absolutely. They are titles. Yes. Last names were titles for the most part. Right. And post 
um, the Industrial Revolution, where we were giving titles based on our roles as slaves, kind of, sort of, you know, shoemakers, uh, metal workers, um, you name it, right? That was kind of how you were assigned your name or you chose your family name. What do you have on Minnesota? Minnesota, uh, a lot. Uh, we'll get to Minnesota, I promise. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, the mounds of Minnesota are incredible. Uh, Tribe of Non, thank you. Great work, buddy. Thanks for your donation. I appreciate you. Appreciate it. I'm glad you're enjoying this. Um, and to all my new people, there's a lot of new faces in chat, and uh, it means a lot. Um, I've been waiting for the Minnesota one too. Yeah. So again, I, I have that is I get more emails. Um, people ask me when I'm going to get to their state. And I was just expending myself too much. I mean, I've kind of talked about this already. So to be sum it up, just to do an anomalous, anomalous America episode, you know, that's a minimum of 10 hours. And I was trying to do one a week. And it was just way too much. I was I was burnt out. I was barely sleeping. I was working through the night. And when you're trying to raise a family, and I work full time, uh... I was just, I was burning the candle from both ends and I just was killing myself. So I decided to try to make a better product and reduce the amount. And so my next episode of Anomalous America comes out on April 5th. I believe that's the right date. April 5th. Um, I'm kind of keeping this state a secret, so stay tuned for that. We're going to get there, I promise. We're getting back on on the Anomalous America train. Um. That was in reference to the white bearded deity. Yes. Yeah. So white was uh, a term that was used to describe a priestly or a holy person. Um, yeah. Yep. And again, we talk about the red man, the ochre people, the red ochre people, um, the sunburnt races. Um, yeah. Again, skin color and, and all these things had 1 million percent less of a meaning than they do today. And I think that's an important thing to remember that this, these focusing on this things that are different between all of us is the key to keeping us separated and warring and arguing and bickering with each other. And to realize that, you know, I, I'm a mix. I have a million different, th I have, you know, I have Mediterranean blood. I have Teutonic blood. I have Irish blood. I have Native American blood. Um, so and I love that about myself, you know, and I love culture there. I love people that stick to their culture and have developed a culture and perhaps lived four or five, six, ten generations in the place that they are now. I think that's beautiful, too. It's all beautiful. And um, I just want to steer away as much as I can from getting hooked on these ideas of skin color and and the kind of trap that that is. Um, where else was I? Yep. White meant enlightened. Thank you, McMack. Yeah, Absolutely. The Tennessee episode was great. Oh, cool. I'm glad you saw it, George. Awesome. And I would point towards the Indian Grave Point cave. Yeah, um, there's so many caves in Tennessee, George. I couldn't cover them all, um, especially along the Mississippi Valley. There are thousands of cave systems. And I, I you know, I wish my epi if my episodes could be 10 hours, I'd run out. I wouldn't run out of material. So Latin was way late in the game. And basically it was like they flipped the way words were written and maybe all yeah, Latin was a bit of an inverted language um, because Latin, as we know today, is definitely different than ancient Latin. And it had a lot of really close ties with what we would even call Arabic, a little more Aramaic. But again, even those words are phonetic. So we want to keep saying phonetic and showing the correlation between, um, you know, a spoken language. Again, this is why we're going to get into the bicameral breakdown, the idea of losing the inner monologue or the creation of this the subconscious and the conscious brains and so on and so forth. That's why white is emphasized as a color you wear, especially I should specify. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Today's concepts today are poisonous. The woke even disregarded. Yeah. Well said, Jason. I agree. I am Micmac blood. Yes. What's your blood type Micmac? If you don't mind me asking. Um, yeah. You know, when they first started breaking down the blood type stuff, you know, they showed that a lot of these, um, quote, native Aboriginal cultures had a lot of O blood. And I got into the blood type thing, too, when I was first learning about my family lineage and seeing the relations between uh, the Basque blood I had in Spain connected with my father's Irish blood and my mother's 
uh, Cherokee blood and, you know, seeing the relations there. And, uh, yeah, there's just one, you just got to do all these things for yourself because no matter what, it's beautiful. And, uh, it, it, to, to each their own meaning will be found. I used to be Mormon and my temple dress was polyester. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. Lady B, they were all linen and you can still, most of, you can still get a lot of them in linen. Um, people can just look up the grounding, um, um, the electrical ion flow of linen versus polyester. It's pretty crazy. O negative, RH negative. I wish I knew my blood type. Oh, you got to figure that out, McMac. 100%. I, I would imagine you have a, a, an RH negative just because I know a lot of the McMacs were RH negative and that they're interbreeding with the Basque people, the highest percentage of RH negative people. Okay. Oh, I could read chat all day. Uh, again, appreciate all of you for being here with me for this video. And let's get back to the article before I get too far off pace again. Um, where were we? The return was impossible. Okay. They're talking about how these people just were like fo following along the coast and the wind blew them to America, which is insane, but we'll, we'll go further. Thus making a grace of necessity. They became teachers of the people. This is not the story that, that Montezuma was told at all. And again, I've told you already, and we've, I've shown this in my queen Moo series, my Mesoamerican series relating that to not only Atlantis stuff, but Lemuria, these cultures and the, 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 the maritime culture was insanely advanced. And these people weren't just willy nilly flying into the wind and hoping they'd hit land. And, you know, it, it, it's ridiculous, but yeah, we're going to go further. So we talked about the, okay. The Toltecs, the seat of the, the empire. Okay. Um, and doubtless during the continuance of their ascendancy, again, the Kahulas, so we'll get into this, 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 these people was the golden age of the American civilization. They reared mighty temples and pyramids and built cities and cultivated farms and practiced many of the industrial arts common to the age of the world. They are credited with having built the great pyramid of the sun and its companion wonder, the pyramid of the moon. Check out my video on that, where I show the astrological correlations between the valley the valley of the dead i may be getting that wrong so many things going through my head and uh you know they were mapping the conjunction of of uh jupiter and saturn and how important that was from an astrological but also an inner um metaphysical relation much more <laughs> Uh, more than 500 years before the advent of Cortes in Mexico, more than three centuries, centuries previous to the Spanish invasion and the conquest of Mexico. Yeah, I mean, remember, Tenochtitlan, they, they called Venice. They called it the Venice of the West. Um, it was an inc incredible place that many people called it Atlantis or the closest thing to Atlantis. And, you know, again, that's the thing that gets really interesting is even Montezuma says that they, you know, they were... They came to Tenochtitlan. They didn't build it. <laughs> it was not necessarily in ruin, but was a city that had uh, the foundations had already been laid. So they were inheritors as well, which correlates a lot with what the Aztecs said, that there were four previous ages all met with serious cataclysms of some kind. More than three centuries previous to the Spanish invasion and conquest of Mexico, the Toltecs had vanquished had been vanquished by a fiercer and more warlike people, the Aztecs, who came from the north. These made extensive conquests and subjugated many of the aboriginal tribes adjacent. The influence of the Toltecan civilization was not lost on their conquerors. The Aztecs had made considerable progress towards civilization under a dynasty of monarchs who, it appears, preferred the arts of peace to a waste caused by war. Again, we're going to show this kind of sacrificial uh, changeover events in the timelines. It's going to be very much, again, as I postulate, related to this, um, this breakdown of the bicameral mind and the age of idolatry and the worshiping of idols and sacrifice coming from these worshiping of idols and, and uh, much more. But yeah. <clears throat> when the conquistadors came and blotted out the last remains of the aboriginal civilization on the continent of North America. Now, again, when you study the takeover of Mesoamerica by the Spaniards, 
you know, even in their own literature, which again, they've done more to destroy the cultural and historical and libraries of these people than anyone else, which they did a great job of doing all over the realm. But they themselves say that they were greeted with open arms and loved and treated as friends and companions. And the, the, the reason they were able to take over uh, Tino Titlan as easy as they did is because of that. And they basically just kidnapped the king and took over the city. And um, their uh, verbal and historical mythos was built around the idea of a, a sea people coming back as they promised to do. And again, we're talking several generations perhaps where these stories had lost their details and, and, you know, again, maybe there's information that we're missing, which I'm sure is partially the case too. But, but, you know, don't fool yourself. I'm sure that these, the Tino Tilan was insanely advanced, the stone cities and the, the, you know, the, their, their waterworks, you know, they basically had this incredible canal system, highway system. Um, you know, M Mexico city is, they, they've, they basically closed off all the dikes and canal systems and, and, and drained the entire basin. And this whole place was the closest representation to Atlantis that we had. Um, but anyways, the last empire was buried amid slaughter and devastation, but the painted blocks of Manuga, Manuga and the neglected gods of Subhatiba and Pensacola the earth pyramids of the Yazoo, the river of ruins, as the name signifies, Casa Grande of New Mexico and Arizona, the ruined temples of Cholula, Zomimilico, I'm, again, I apologize, I'm going to murder these, Palenque, Uxmal, and Ometepec are evidences of a golden age of civilization in America, as well as in Europe, far back in the past. The Zuni villages of New Mexico, Arizona, Zuni, we'll, we'll, we'll get into more of that when we talk about Casa Grande as well, and how Casa Grande is laid out just like the temple cities of Peking in China. The Zuni villages of New Mexico, the ancient Cibola of the Spaniard Chronicles, remember Cibola, a city of seven, seven golden cities that were built on seven hills. We're going to break down the seven hills of Ireland that the seven hills of Rome were built completely to mir mirror these seven hills in Ireland, and that all these seven hills, which I had pulled up just so I could show you, it's insane. I've done a, I've talked about these in several of my Anomalous America videos, but the city of seven hills is worldwide, and my family lives just out, just up the road from Rome, Georgia a city of seven hills that they're quite proud of. And I've standed on all of them and uh, breaking down the Cherokee, their Romulus and Remus Roman um, historical references are crazy and mind blowing. And can again, connect a lot of these dots, even to a modern, even to just a few hundred years ago. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind, the city of seven hills and how it's, it's all around the realm. These people made adobes and built houses and cultivated the soil and domesticated animals and manufactured cloth and made vessels of clay. And in some of the advanced arts of civilized life, excelled hundreds of years before the voyage of Columbus. Fabrics are now made as they were made as they were made ages ago. And the skill of men with all the boasted appliances and machinery has never been able to produce textures equal to the Zunian blankets. Now, the weaving of the Zunian blankets we'll get into and show how they have all the markers of a culture from, quote, from the East, even though I would say that's just a, a remembering of a culture that, that uh, was long gone, unfortunately. Major Grimes of the United States Army, now stationed in this city, served for a considerable time in New Mexico, and while there collected many specimens of the handiwork of the strange people who still dwell in the renowned Cibola, the modern Zunia. Now we're going to talk about New Mexico and that in my New Mexico video, we break down all of the Irish, Aryan, Druidic, standing stone altars that exist there and the similarities between, again, the Cibola stories, the Zuni people, um, yeah, and much more. A Tonaha water pot, beautifully decorated, may be seen at the mining exchange 
on 4th Street in this city. The work shows the manufacturer to have been both skilled and artistic. Fragments, the works of men, lie scattered over the continent from the lakes to the isthmus. Images and temples crumbling in ruins attest to the high degree of civilization attained by the inhabitants of the lost empire of America. The mound builders of the United States, driven by fierce hordes of barbarous Indians, Scythian Tartars, took refuge in Mexico and Central America, and mingling with the southern Mongolians, who, coming across the Pacific Ocean from China and Japan, and the Malayans, who had also established themselves on this continent. They laid the foundation of the civilization. See, now, you can kind of see the chicanery here, right? He's talking about that the historical references were given are that these people were sailing along the coast of Africa and got blown off course and ended up here. But then in the same breath, we're talking about the Malayans, which have a strong cultural identity in Mesoamerica, Central America. Now, how would that be? Did they accidentally sail, you know, 5,000 miles? Same with the Mongolians, the Japanese. We One need only look at Manco Capac and the Peruvian Empire and see the undeniable relations between the Japanese. We're going to show the relation between um, the Ayesa, the Ari, and the Japanese. Um, again, China. Uh, who are the Chinese? You know, their earliest dynasties trace themselves to what we would call Olmec. So how does that even make sense? Who had also established themselves on this continent? They laid the foundation of that civilization, which after under many mutations, exactly, had established itself in the Valley of Mexico where Cortez found it. Yeah, and I wouldn't agree more with that paragraph there that at what Cortez found, you know, when he, he Cortez described ruins um, all around and that Montezuma even said the same thing, that they basically inherited a realm that had been destroyed from in a previous age. The Aztecs described several ages and that we're living in the fourth, perhaps the fifth. It gets a little foggy if it's the fourth or we're in the fifth, or if there's been fourth, four ages destroyed and we're in the fifth. Or, um, But yeah, so when I talk about this with the, you know, we can talk about the mines and, and these, but when they dig down even below these temple sites that we see today, Uxmal, um, so on and so forth, that there is much more beneath it. And there are several cultures below and buried under and buried under and buried under. And the same goes for America. So, yeah, that was kind of why I chose this video. So I could title the things the way I titled it, get a good little synopsis here. We could talk again about the Irish. We're talking about the Scythians. We're talking about Mongolians. We're talking about the, the Mesoamerican cultures. We're showing the relations between the Phoenician adventurers and how they play into all of this. And yeah, so bouncing around a little bit. There are seven hills around Washington, D.C. Yeah, it's everywhere. The seven hills, again, goes back to the Ari, the Aryan cultures, this kind of universal church of IS, so to say. Um, Issa, ISIS, uh, on and on and on and on and on. Uh, I'm going to go through comments here a little bit, and then we're going to finish up here with my last article. Uh, okay, we'll start from the bottom. Um, do, 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 do. and now they take refuge in the hood fallen state of being yep abraham from ur was taught the secrets of astrology and what people have the correct idea of astrology ancient americans yeah right we're gonna go get into a book called the ur of the chaldees how ireland was known as that this is going to help us connect the land of ur right i, I show this correlation with urland Orlando, Florida being a, a, a root of these same cultural representations. How astrology is number one. We're going to talk about the Maga, the Magi, the, the, the Druidic astrological quote serpent race. Um, how these were the seekers of magnetism, um, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot to that there, but yeah, Ireland. Ireland, Ireland, yeah, absolutely. So again, um, it sounds like you're probably familiar with this, Sean. Um, but yeah, Ur of the Chaldees, a great book. I've mentioned it before. I've talked about it in other videos. We're going to get into that. 
because water in Mexico contains parasites in the American water system, that is why they tell you to not drink the water if you go to Mexico. Montezuma's revenge, curse for stealing. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Um, absolutely. Um, even though in the Yucatan, you know, some of the most incredible spring water is found there. What is up with the city of Seven Hills? What does it mean? Uh, it's, you know, the seven, the number seven. Broski Bear is probably one of the most sacred numbers. It, it represents musical scale. It represents um, the human body. It shows the undeniable relation between the human form, the creation, that we're a piece of God, that we're a mere image as above, so below of the realm we inhabit, the planetary bodies. I just that's something that would take a whole episode for me to explain. And maybe when I get into more of a metaphysical video series, we can break down the importance of the number seven, but it's anciently one of the most important uh, uh, sets of numbers as it encodes where we find ourselves in this realm we inhabit the seven Hills connection to the seven. That's part of it, but it's many things. Yeah. It's many things. Um, Apparently, it's always the, the way people come back to the surface out of cataclysm with technology, so it seems godlike. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how many cultures have a subterranean mythos? Uh, a lot of them. <laughs> a lot of them. I talked about this in my last stream. Um, indeed, old illustrations and depictions of Mexico City are incredible. I mean, Cortez said himself that it was one of the most beautiful cities he'd ever seen. And, it, you know, people act like he, you know, again, there are many voyages that had set out scouting, so to say, but the idea that they didn't know what was over here is a joke. If you missed it, the ancient scarab, yeah, I definitely would check out my ancient scarab video. That's, you know, more of a Egyptian iconography, but the scarab is a sacred symbol and it's found all over ancient America and Mesoamerica. Um direction symbolism north is the direction towards earth and the cardinal theme that comes with it represented yeah capricorn yeah you can think of north as ground down um yeah this again is kind of a the idea of the feet and the south being um it's energetic absolutely whole technology oh good one i like that uh why do all oh die montezuma's revenge yeah it poisoned the water. I answered that one earlier. Um, I have a handful of my favorite channels, and they are all out of my UK time zone. Good job. I am already quite unfortunately an insomniac. <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're in the UK, God bless you for for joining me. Eight or nine hours ahead. My Basque friend is the only AB negative I know. Oh, yeah. I mean, my whole family is A negative except my mother, who's O negative. Um, yeah, and and my my. My mother's side has uh, can be traced to uh, northern Spain, a Basque hotspot, so to say. And their cultures, they say the same thing that I'm describing here, that they migrated to Spain from the west. I'm here for the Mexicon connection. Yeah, we're going to break down the titles again, as McMack was saying earlier. Uh, hey, Ben Ben, do you think the bridge collapsed today have anything to do with the with the man the bridge was named after didn't he write the music for star spangled banner um certainly possible i have seen a bit of that today and i actually funny you mentioned it was like man i should do a breakdown on this um again it's quite easy to see that things like this that happened whenever there's these events that draw a, a large amount of human attention it's an energetic thing and that these i i look at these things that happen um kind of holographically and that they can somewhere be some way in some ways be an outward expression of inner uh calamity or dialogue that's existing in a culture in that area or that's going on and you know one need to look at a bridge what is a bridge is you know the energetic correlations with bridges and circuitry and and commerce and you know the ship the ship is the mind um you know, ships and all of their terminologies just are all wrapped up in the psychology of the brain. So when a ship loses power and collides with the bridge, symbolically, we could go quite deep there. Um, if I have time, um, maybe I'll do a breakdown on that. 
but but yeah uh you could just start looking at the names of things again like i said there's a, a little introduction that you could go with just look at etymology of bridge of ship um and, and look at look at it at terms of circuitry and try to think fourth dimensionally when it comes to looking at these um events that happen um because there's always an as above, so below, as within, so without representation to think about when it comes to these. If you give blood in the U.S., I believe you can ask what your blood type is. You can, Joe. They know your blood type. Let me give you an example. My mother, who has worked in the medical field all of her life, she is O negative. And they beg her. They pay her. And they beg her. They call her all the time because her blood is as precious because it's universal. Her blood can be given, and her blood can save anyone's life on the planet. Um, the study of blood is an incredible thing. It's, it's again, going back to what I was just answering the question about the bridges and the ship. Think about iron, blood, what blood really does, the symbolic nature of blood, its relation to the heart, what the heart is doing, the sounds created by the pumping of the heart, the etheric field created by the heart, the tori toroidal field created by the heart there's so much to go with oh negative um, that's awesome okay uh i'll get too far off subject here so i appreciate all these f amazing comments you guys uh so you honestly need me to pull up scripture that shows god taught abraham knowledge of the stars uh no i, I again i let's keep things positive here if people have disagreements with you or you think differently of something that's totally fine. Respect that. And, and, and astrology is really, really important. And yeah, so seeing AB saved by God, seeing Abe, Terra represented, then God told them to go to Canaan. They stopped at Haran nearby. It's like the desert, meaning Haran, Terra, passed there. The, uh, again, looking at the, the stories of the Bible and all of these things, um, from a metaphysical standpoint, a mythological standpoint, metaphorical standpoint, is by far the most promising and will provide you the most rewards as an, a story of your inner dialogue. That's that's the best I can represent. But let's try to keep things positive in chat. Okay, we're going to finish up here. Uh, I wanted this to be about 90 minutes, and we're getting real close to that, aren't we? Okay, and this is a large article, so maybe we'll just do half of it as a two-pager. It's a big one. This this is from 1867. Uh, what did I just do? I pulled it off the tab. Okay. Um, but again, ultimately, I appreciate each and every one of you. Thanks for being here with me tonight. Again, as always, without uh, you guys, I wouldn't. this wouldn't happen. So again, this is uh, 1867. An extraordinary discovery. The remains of an Icelandic woman buried in 1051 with trinkets, Roman coins, etc. exhumed below the Great Falls of the Potomac. A remarkable runic inscription. America discovered by the Irish. The following is a further account of the alleged remarkable discovery near the falls of the Potomac. Before agreeing to accept the statements as entirely credible and may be well to await the opinions of gentlemen of good scientific reputation at Washington. Which you know what that means. Hey guys, before you take this entirely incredible, wait until the government people get here and you're never going to hear about it again. That's what that means. <clears throat> Permit me through your columns to publish the details of the discovery near the city of Washington of the remains of the Icelandic Christian woman who died in the year 1051 and of the inscription in runic characters which remarks, which marks her grave, the announcement of which has already sped by telegraph through the new world to the old. To publish a fact which materially affects the history of the discovery of America by Europeans. By adding one more proof to many now generally received by historians of the extraordinary voyages of the adventurous Northmen, without compass or quadrant to the eastern coast of this continent, five centuries before the landing of Columbus, and to fix the extent of their inland explorations. Now, again, we're dealing with a culture who's thinking way differently than what I'm trying to portray to you guys. All these ancient cultures are telling you we came from the West after a cataclysm so don't think for a second that these northmen or these vikings or these Finns or phoenicians didn't have a compass and that sea travel was as was far more advanced than they're leading on 
right? Keeping the idea of America and its antiquity as, as secret as long as possible was very important for the takeover of this continent. The eastern coast, five centuries before the landing of Columbus, and to fix the extent of their inland explorations, at least in one direction, besides to record some curious items with respect to the habits and customs of this hardy people, to note a most interesting specimen of their early monumental characters or runes. Again, we're going to break down runic, uh, ogum. We're going to kind of show correlations between all of these hieroglyphics to confirm in a most striking manner the authenticity of the Icelandic historical sagas, sages, sorry, and to give another illustration of the great length of time it requires to write an accurate and truthful history. And in doing, I shall endeavor to be plain and brief. And if I do not give all the minute, I crave the indulgence of your readers to wait the publication within the coming year of the full account of my archaeological researches in the Orkneys, Iceland, America, etc., wherein the more copious text will be accompanied with maps and drawings. Uh, the Skalholt Saga. In 1863, in digging about the ruins of the ancient college of Skalholt in Iceland, bearing the Latin MS, bearing date 1117, and now known as the Skoholt Saga, was exhumed entire. This was, before this time, unknown, except from a fragment in the famous collection of MSS of Arnus Mag Magnius, which was destroyed by fire. It is a most remarkable story, apparently written by a monk, purports to give a historical count of the explorations of the Icelanders in the new found Vinland. Now, again, remember these titles, Vinland, uh, Ireland, the great, and we're going to relate this to part two, maybe part three of Norumbega. What was this mysterious Norumbega? And in the country to the south and west called, I'm not even going to try, Huti Tramanaland. Okay, so this is really interesting. So there you have an Icelandic definition because Great Ireland was also known as Manaland. Now, when you break down the word mana and you find it existing not only amongst the Mi'kmaq, shout out Mi'kmaq, but amongst all these native tribes, this term mana, again, the mana of the Bible, and so many other things, just a little anecdote there. Or Ireland in Mikla, Great Ireland, which is spoken of as having been long before discovered and visited repeatedly by the Irish. This is a most important statement, for although there are numerous allusions in the sagas and even in the land Namabak of unimpeachable veracity of this earliest discovery of America by the Irish, they are but vague and uncertain. It also narrates the adventures of the Northmen with the Skralings, i.e. small and puny men, as they styled the natives in derision of their cowardly and skulking habits. Now, it, these Skralings and the idea of fairies and dwarfs, nowhere have I found a more perfect representation of these, of these mythos and, and these stories existing than here. The land of the dwarfs was Tennessee. It was known as the land of the dwarfs. And that there was a subterranean culture in what we call Tennessee, Kentucky, this region of small men that lived underground. These stories exist all over. Obviously, many people are familiar with them. And not only Iceland, the elves, um, the Scandinavian countries, but that that those those stories exist really strongly with the Aboriginal or Native Americans here as well. And uh, I've shown, uh, historically, they found quite a lot of evidence of this in the late 1700s, early 1800s. The scrawlings, okay. And among other things, there is an account of a voyage under the command of her vader along the coast of Manaland in a southerly direction from Vinland, Martha's Vineyard. Interesting, right? Martha, Martha's Vineyard. Um, yeah. Where they had wintered and repaired their ship, and thence north and northwest up a sea and various rivers, the ascent in one which was finally stopped by succession of falls, to which, from their general shape and foamy appearance, they gave the name 
Hevidsirk, or White Skirt. These falls are particularly noticed for it is stated that in their neighborhood, the illegitimate daughter, the illegitimate daughter of Snorri, who was born in Vinland and was a son of Karlsvein by Gudrid, the widow of Thorstein, was killed with a small spear and arrow and buried near the spot where she fell. Now, Sir Thomas Murray, to whom the Skullhold saga was referred by its discoverer, Mr. Philip Marsh, and by whom it was recently been translated into English, has conjectured that the sea here spoken of as receiving the waters of several large rivers on its western shores, and up which the adventurers seem to have sailed, is the Chesapeake Bay. And from some observation as to length, the length of days and nights by which the latitude was determined, he supposed that the White Skirt Falls was the Great Falls in the Potomac River above Washington, the only falls in any of the Chesapeake Rivers. But this he mentioned as merest fancy to which no importance could be attached. However, but to anticipate the substance of this letter, it is now permitted to me to say that the authenticity of the Skullhold Saga being indisputably established by the recent discovery of the very grave of the daughter of Snorri, the speculations of this very grave of the daughter, or the speculation of this learned gentleman are proved to be correct. The confirmation of this saga will also clinch the theory that the Irish were the first Europeans to discover the continent of America. Now, what is a European? Again, this is a slippery slope. I don't want to get held up on these titles. I'm sticking with the migrations moving to the east that, as I've stated so many times before, all these cultures say the old world is the west, the Americas, and that through the horrible cataclysms, they migrated either by land bridge or by sea. But it's the details here that are important. The discovery with this interesting saga, as well as many others in my mind since my arrival in the United States, I have made several trips to the Great Falls of the, of the Potomac to ascertain if any traces of the visit of Hervander were to be found. Having examined the prominent rocks above and below the falls for a distance of several miles, on June 28th, on the 28th of June, 1867, in company with M. Lewis Lacurix, the distinguished geolo geologist, Professor Brand of Washington, and Dr. Boyce of Boston, I had the happiness and satisfaction to discover the most indisputable proofs of this early Icelandic voyage in a runic inscription marking the grave of an Icelandic woman named Suasu, and afterwards by exhuming the partial remains of a human body in the very spot indicated by the runes. Now we have uh, quote runic inscriptions of Norsemen, Norsemen, Phoenicians found all over my home state of Oregon, in Washington, on Vancouver Island, in British Columbia, in Alaska. So again, these people weren't just drifting off course in Africa and finding their way to Alaska. I mean, that's ridiculous. And again, this will tie in with probably part two will break down the Phoenicians and show their their Finnish, Irish, uh, American. Uh, correlations. Uh, this inscription, to which I have given the name of the white shirt runic inscription, is on the northeast side of the large rock commonly called the Arrowhead in the Potomac River, two miles below the Great Falls and about 13 above the city of Washington. It is protected by the overarching of the rock above and was, when discovered, partially covered with lysen, A very crooked spruce pine with a hole about seven inches in diameter has grown up nearby and has not only served also to shelter it for the past century, but now indicates its location, for it is the only spruce pine within a circle of 200-yard radius. The upper left-hand corner of the inscription is five feet above the ground, the lower right-hand corner three feet. The letters are about three inches high and vary in depth from an indentation just precipitable to eight 
to an eighth of an inch. The inscriptions consist of six lines, which in length are a little shorter than usual in Navak inscriptions, but this altogether governed by the surface of the rock. The rock is very hard sandstone gray with a brownish tint, about 19 feet long, 17 high, and 27 to 9 broad. It rests upon its southeast corner and has a grain running at an angle of 17 degrees from the plane of the river's surface and pointing to the northwest. It is without fissures and has but few loose spalls. The human remains were found six feet from the inscription, nine from the root of the spruce, and 32 from the water mark on that day, the river being a little above its average height. The inscription. The white shirt inscription transposed into Roman letters reads as follows. I'm not going to bother. I'll, I'll zoom in. So hopefully you guys can pause it if you want to go back. Here it is right here. Which translated into English as nearly literally as possible and omitting the signs reads thus. Here rest CSA or Suasu, the fair-haired, a person from the east of Iceland, the widow of Lord, the sister of Thorgor, children of the same father, 25 years of age, may God make glad her soul. 1051. This remarkable epitaph is written in the ancient style of runes known as the Navak, a variety found only in the Orkneys and in the Isle of Barjof. Its characteristics are well marked consisting chiefly in combining the perpendicular stroke, the letters I, J, or E with the following letter, if the letter has no diagonal stroke to the left, compared with the more common variations, the Helsing and the Stofkar's runes, the former of which is distinguished by the want for the perpendicular stroke, only the diagonal stroke being left, the latter by a very long perpendicular on which several letters are written by means of the proper diagonal strokes under one another. It is easily recognized by being the most regular and deepest cut and having more frequent and various signs, heathenish and, la and laterally Roman. Again, it's Etruscan. We'll show that, okay? Because the idea of Roman letters changes quite drastically in the mid-1800s, as I showed in my Etruscan series. It is also by far the most ancient variation, though it was employed with remarkable purity on monumental stones in the Orkneys as late as the 14th century. The Potomac inscription has also some negative characteristics which are of sufficient value to notice here. It has no letters distorted with curves and ornamented lines. It hence possesses in its nakedness and clearness a characteristic of the most ancient runic inscriptions. It has no pricked runes, as though those characters were called, which the monks added to the runic alphabet to make it agree entirely with the Latin. Again, this is what I was mentioning earlier with some of you guys, that the 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 fall of Eturia, the rewriting, rewriting, the destruction of Eturian culture, language, history, the replacing of it, and the Latinization, or the um inversion of the latinization which is very much etruscan latin being a, a very large corruption of that and here they're stating quite obviously that the monks have entirely changed and made things align with the latin so they're taking older texts and corrupting them to make them align in a certain way or who knows, changing their meaning altogether. A specimen of which is found in the King Kursok inscription bearing a date of 1135 and the Farger stone bearing the date 1147. Okay, we're going to finish here with this paragraph, and this will be part of part two, where we'll finish this inscription. We'll dive into what Ireland the Great was, its possible locations, and, and we'll, we'll break into the Phoenicians. Who were the Phoenicians? At least my perspective that was altered with a very old text from the mid-1800s. It has no cryptographic characters. So I'm going to finish up with this paragraph, and then I'm going to go through and read as many comments as I can and have some dialogue to finish this up and kind of get some feedback. So if there's any questions or anything you want to say, go ahead and get it out now, and I'll do my best to get through as much of your comments as I can. 
It has no cryptographic characters, with the exception of the characteristic of the Navak runes already spoken of, a style of monograms which is found in numbers in the cave of Paradis in Iceland and on the monuments near Sigtuna, Sweden. It has no figures of men or animals. It has no Roman letters intermingled with the runic. It lacks, hence, the peculiarities which the famous Azonot or Dighton writing rock in Massachusetts. I have a whole article on the Dighton rock. Hopefully we'll get into that too. It's said to possess, for I have not yet examined this inscription personally and speak but from report, namely figures, Roman letters, as well as cryptographs, and in all inexplicable confusion. In fine, although the epitaph of Suasu was engraved more than half a century after the introduction of Christianity into Iceland, and Christianity, the roots of Christianity in Iceland are almost identical with this, this quote, Icelandic Ari Iessa representation of Christianity, not the corrupted one. Remember, as they were just stating here, that the monks of Rome were changing everything to fit the Latin. Now, who knows what all we lost in that translation? A lot, I'm sure. It's called his story for a reason. And fine, although the epitaph, blah, 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 I read that, and marked the grave of one doubtless born in the true faith, yet it contains nothing foreign or Roman save the cross and the signification of the date of death. Again, the cross, the, Ro the, the Celtic cross, the cross, the oldest, most universal symbol there is. It is hence, or the swastika, as many terms, but it is hence one of the purest and most important runic inscriptions that are at present known. Okay, so we're going to pause there and come back. This is a two-parter. It's a big article, and we'll get into more of the stuff that was found alongside her body, the human remains, the coins, etc. And due to time, we're going to pause there. I'm going to go back and just kind of show you um, some things I posted um, over the last few days, just as my mind has been focused on getting this episode out. Arians, area in Zen means venerable. It's kind of like Mick Mac was saying earlier about the idea of the priesthood, venerable, chiefly, um, the idea of the white robes, right? The, those that were robed in white, the toga, the universality of this kind of Aryan symbol, right? The Aryan was used as a title of honor in Persia empires, clearly shown by cuneiform inscriptions of Darius. I did a video on Darius. Check that out. He calls himself Arya or Ari Kitra, an Aryan or of Aryan descent, and a Huru Mazda, or as he is called by Darius, Aru Mazda, is rendered in the Turanian translation and of inscription of Behitsun, the god of the Aryas. Many historical names of the Persians contain the same element. The great-grandfather of Darius is called in the inscriptions Ari Rama, Ramna, Ari Ramnez. The suffix is Ramna or Ramni, Again, this is where we're going to connect the pharaohs, Ramses, Skota, Queen Skota, the Skota, the Saka, the, the Scythian, Irish uh, connection with ancient America. In the names of the grandfather of Darius, noticed, need to be noticed which reflect the name of the Hindu god Rama. Again, we'll connect the Brahmas with the, the Druids as well. This is also found in present Hindu names. Um, in later Sanskrit, the word Arya signifies a noble family, and wherever this people wandered and located, they have left in the nomenclatures of the countries the traces of their presence. As in Armenia in Iran, again, the Armenian genocide, you look at what their version of Christianity was. It's, I think, probably one of the last remnants of this Ayesa uh, uh, Ari. Ari Lind, Ari version of what we call Christianity, not the Roman um, misrepresentation that the Council of Nicaea took and, and re rewrote. The ancient name of Thrace is that of Ari, a German tribe on the Vistula, and even in Ireland, the Celts, who were the first people who colonized Europe and who were driven westward by the wave of Teutonic migration, just as the Finns were by the Sclavs at an early period covered Switzerland and the Tyrol, the region south of the Danube, the Gaul, the Belgium, and Britain. And it is worthy of note that the ancient name Aaron is not derived from Erin or Western Isle, but from the word Ur, again, Ur of the Chaldee, Ur or 
Eri, which in Celtic has exactly the same signification as Arya in Sanskrit. Um, this is talking about the swastika or the cross, as I'm sure was found with this, this buried Icelandic woman. This cross was the emblem of Buddhism. Again, we're going to show how these symbols correlate all of this back to one focal point. Was the emblem of Buddhism before the Christian era and is a symbol of wonderfully broad diffusion throughout the old world. Yeah, broad everywhere. It is the sacred emblem of Vishnu and appears again in the hammer of Thor. It has been found in Celtic mounds, on Etruscan scenery urns, and on those taken by Sinaloa from the Phoenician tombs of Cyrus. It appears, now when you look at it, some of the oldest drawings or physical representation of what a Phoenician was, they were togas covered in swastikas, sandal-wearing white togas covered in swastikas. It appears on the oldest Greek coins, those of Chalcedon, Syracuse, and Corinth. It is graven on the sepulchers of the Mycenae. It is in the most common of those found by Dr. Schielman on the site of ancient Troy. Egypt and China contributed to the archaeological collections. The carved footprints of Buddha are signed with it, and it is decorated the prows of the ships of the King Rama, which crossed the Ganges 1,000 years before Christ was born. It was a religious symbol of very great importance among the early progenitors of the Aryan races and has been found in the Old World ruins wherever the Aryan people have dwelt. Again, connecting this with Arizuna, where you find more swastikas than anywhere in the Americas. Have dwelt. There would seem to be nothing needed to identify the five worshiping civilizations of this country before the time of written history with the fire-worshiping civilization of the Old World and the Orient. Again, fire-worshiping, sun-worshiping, they're one and the same almost. The, sands, the swastika corresponds to the goddess Venus. Again, we're going to get into this when we talk about Easter and Ostera. This cross was used to generate the sacred fire of the god Agni. It was laid horizontally upon the ground, and a stick called the Kramatha, or father, this is where the roots of Prometheus come from, was inserted into a central aperture and revolved until it ignited by friction. There is no reason to doubt that its use among the people with those whose skeletons is now found was diff what is now found was different from what it was with Buddha. No, certainly it was not any different, and it existed everywhere, and these unified worldwide priest class um it's it's again incredibly sacred. The learned Dr. Schilleman, which we mentioned in the previous article, discoverer of the site of ancient Troy, testifies that the signs of both cross and swastika were during thousands of years before Christ, religious symbols of the highest importance. Among the earliest ancestors of the Aryan race in Bactria and in the Valley of Oxus, at the epoch when Germans, Indians, Pelasians, Celts, Persians, Slavs, and Iranians constituted really important, a single and as yet undivided nation, all speaking the same language. And I'd go as far as to say the entire world or realm. Professor Wilson says, in the estimation of certain writers, it has been respectively the emblem of Zeus, of Baal, of the sun, of the sun god, of the sun chariot, of Agni, of the fire god, of Indra, the rain god of the sky, the sky god, and finally the deity of all deities, the great god, the maker and ruler of the universe. It has also been held to symbolize light, or the god of light, of the forked lightning and of water. In the estimation of others, it represents Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, creator, preserver, destroyer. Beyond its Buddhistic significances, it stands for the Jupiters, Toanans, Luvis, and of Latins, and the Thor of the Scandinavians. Its appearance on the person of certain goddesses, Artemis, Hera, Demeter, Astarte, and the Chaldean Nana, has caused it to be claimed as the sign of fecundity, whatever the hell that means. 
Okay. So that was just a little bit of of clippings that I wanted to share. Uh, there's tons more on my on my Twitter. I break down Isaac, Isaacson, Isaacson, Saki, Saka, Scythian, Escani, Sar, Caesar, Juridics, the Magi, the Magog, Gog and Magog, kind of destroying that whole idea. Um, the Church of Iessa, blah, 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 blah. So if you want little tidbits, my Twitter for the last few days is packed full of stuff there. And now I'm just going to kind of roll through uh, chat here. And uh, again, appreciate all of you. 272 people here. Grateful for each and every one of you. Thanks for being here. This is part one in the series. I'm not 100% sure what part two is going to be. We're going to finish this article. We're going to talk about the Phoenicians. I'm going to share some pretty hidden information about who the Phoenicians were. <laughs> Their symbols and symbology um, um, connected with alchemy. And then we'll probably dive a little bit more into Ireland the Great, uh, Vinland, and Norumbega. All right. Going ancient, ancient Irish, Gaelic, Tuatha de Dana, good knowledge, Connor McDary, the Druids. Let's go. Yeah, rock and roll. -a. Hopefully you've been here for a while. I already mentioned Connor McDary. Um, you know, his book is one of my favorites. Uh, um, yeah. What is it? Uh, well, archaics, if that's the actual archaics, welcome. And hey, guys, and Abbott, F off. Anyone? Well, <clears throat> let's, again, as I've said so many times before, this is a place to be respectful and hate to see anyone arguing with anybody else um certainly not something I, i'm looking for if that is actual archaics welcome um love your work a lot of correlations between ours um roman catacombs that's a great one the symbology they found in the catacombs quite clearly very much shows this uh latent representation latent lexicon appreciate the presentation of book recommendations yeah connor mcdary whoo Amazing book, incredible stuff. Um, and again, I, I can't recommend my Etruscan series. It'll really kind of set the the back the backstory for what I'm correlating here again between um, ancient India, the Brahmins, the Druids, these kind of uh, these ancient priests. Tribe of Dan, yep, Tuatha de Dana, the tribe of Dan, the Dan Zantes. They are found in uh, lore all over Mesoamerica. This, uh, they were even said to be worshippers of a black stone. They created a mecca in um, Central America, and the tribe of Dan, the Dan, the Danites. Whew, I go into this quite a lot in my um, Anomalous America, Utah episode. Uh, he is also said he descended from David and is the Lion of Judah. I'm not sure we're speaking of there, but yeah, we, we'll get into uh, the, the Lost Tribes and uh, the Tribe of Benjamin, Tribe of... Uh, we'll talk about King David, his relation to pros possibly being Prester John, so on and so forth. Sea peoples came from the Americas to the Mediterranean after a massive... Absolutely. Yep. I could agree with that more. Even the Etruscans say that. The Egyptians say that. Um, where else? Round Towers of Atlantis by Henry. O oh, yeah. Great book. Well said, Juju. Round Towers of Atlantis by Henry O'Brien. Yeah, the, the standing towers, um, the Atlantean overlays with uh, um, ancient constructions, which I've covered a lot. Zero Chance Christ was a Jew. He said he was the son of God, son of man. I mean, yes and no, Lisa. Again, you know, let's leave that to each one of us. You know, it's easy, just as easy to say that, that Christ is an inter, that is, Christ is a, a, a mythopoetical story of yourself. Uh, Pharaoh's remains are European and phenotypes, red hair, DNA linked to Europeans more than people in Egypt today. Yes and no. There's a lot of correlations there. Again, I've shown that there are more mummies of the, quote, Egyptian style found in the Americas. And in fact, the Smithsonian was stealing thousands of mummies from America and shipping them to Europe. So we can't wholeheartedly trust the um, the kind of Nile that we know of today and uh, the rebranding of pharaohs. They've really fucked with the lineage of the pharaohs a lot. Uh, what else? What else? What else? I have one of those togas. Cool. Alien Christianity. Absolutely. Already in, already in Christianity, right? They also found Akkadian iconography in the tunnels. Yeah, Akkadia. Um, I mentioned a book earlier between Acadia and Acadia and Acadians, Sumerians, Sumerians. Um, 
what else? Uh, astrology is important. Before Greeks in the Middle East, America had their own names and things associated with heavenly bodies. Yeah, I mean, some of the most incredible, incredibly advanced astrology exists in the Americas. But again, I'm not trying to set one apart from the other. I'm just, I'm just trying to connect them all to one central point in time. Um, what else we got here? Let's hit that thumb. Thank, thanks, Sean. Yeah. Hope everyone's enjoying this. Love you guys so much. I missed, uh, okay. That's as far. We'll go back down a little bit here and see what I missed. And then uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Jason and Ben Ben would be a great team. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Hopefully again, but let's be respectful of everybody. You know, everyone's going to have differences of opinions no matter what. And, uh, yeah. Um, oh, cool. Um, well, thanks. Welcome, Archaics. Uh, Ben Ben is way more grounded, focused. Oh, James Kirk. Good to see you, buddy. It's been a while. Um, yeah. Pharaohs are related to Native Americans. Um, I'm just saying that there is a lot of proof to indicate that the pharaohs had dynasties here in the Americas and that the, uh, the kind of steam that is America is Egypt or was Egypt. I say that there's just as much proof to say that they were sister cities or that as the Egyptians say themselves, they migrated from the lands of the West of the red lands and that the red lands were uh, here, in the Americas and that the Nile of Africa is a mirror of the Mississippi or the Mississippi before these destructions of territories and lands that have wrecked the Americas more than Europe. Uh, Europe has a lot of obviously destruction and there's been a lot that's happened there and there are civilizations that have been rotten, destroyed and one built on the other. But um, from a, again, the perspectives and timelines I focus on late 1700s through the 1800s America, um, they were still digging us out of this buried age. So uh, to author did Donna beat the furball giants. Oh yeah, we'll get into that. We'll talk about the Fomorians and giants and pygmies and all that stuff. We'll tie in more of the you know Conor McDary stuff, uh, the idea of uh, the Finnish um, sagas, um, and we'll connect that again with uh, kind of Lord of the Rings style um, uh, mythos. But yeah, here we go. I'm gonna call it there. I got. My whole family downstairs waiting for me. So I appreciate all of you. Uh, got close to that 300 mark. Um, pretty excited about that. Appreciate all of you guys very much. Uh, stay tuned for part two. Um, I think my next video is going to be, um, like I stated earlier, getting finishing this article, getting more into the idea of Vinland, um, Ireland the Great, what area that encompassed, talking about Norumbega maybe just set the foundations for Norumbega and break into this Phoenician article that I've been saving for over a year now. And then uh, stay tuned for my Easter episode. You know, we'll do a little, I plan on doing a video for all the holidays and uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll connect the dots with the equinox and um, yeah, a few other things. So appreciate all of you guys so much. Um, hope, hope you love this. And Michelle Gibson would be epic. Yeah, I mean, I don't have her contact info. I'm sure I could get it. So, but uh, I would love to talk to Michelle. But yeah, um, appreciate you guys. Stay tuned for more. Um, thanks for keeping the chat as positive as you can. And, you know, just remember to love one another and be respectful. We're trying to tear down these barriers of separation and, and, um, remember, um, you know, a time when, what we were all kind of the goods of our deeds and the, the truth of our heart and all those things, you know, as, as, as cliche as that is, that's, that's what I'm trying to do and, and uh, kind of tear down the veil of confusion and so on and so forth. But yeah, love you guys. Stay tuned and uh, see you on the next live stream, hopefully Sunday for the Easter show. 
that depends on, you know, obviously family stuff, but uh, we may do that on Monday. But either way, love y'all. Have a wonderful night. Bye, guys.